Welcome to Designing Cities for All, another episode. And it's part of our two-year-long activity and research program. Where we take a deep dive into designing products, spaces and systems for all. Just because you feel safe or you feel welcome or you feel included, doesn't mean that uh, everyone else around you feels the same way. We don't stand alone. We're not individuals that somehow a planet or an island, you know. And I think that's the beautiful thing of a diverse society that everyone can add something from out of their own experience. Things won't change just if we just let things happen. So I think if you can uh, build relationships and use design as a tool to build those relationships, the better off we're all going to be. Everything around us was once designed and can therefore be redesigned. <laughs> Belonging is, is a very, very important concept. You can try to take someone's place for a while, but you don't have the lift experience. Let's begin by acknowledging similarity and affinity. Be a person, not your role. I think inclusion is not a choice. Inclusion happens by design or not at all. In order to create truly inclusive public spaces that are accessible to everyone, we have to underline what everyone actually is. Real inclusion, it's got nothing to do with the norm, but it's like something that we create from all different perspectives. You know, so even when we bring everybody at the table, does everybody's voice count the same? Because it's a big question of, of who tells these stories? You know, the more I explore about other cultures, other religions, is the more ingredients I have to make the architecture and to answer the questions I get from society. Not fitting in was a blessing, or I would have turned out just like you. <laughs> Great. Welcome here, everyone. My name is Lindsay Vida, and I'm very happy to be here at this table to moderate this conversation tonight and have a conversation with all of you. Uh, and what you just saw in those two minutes was a wrap up of the first year of Designing Cities for All. As my colleague said, it was it's a two year research and activity program that takes a deep dive into designing products and places and systems for all. And uh, next to designers and scientists and experts and educational institutions and all types of other partners, um, six fellows were also invited to curate part of the program. And the fellows that we have here at the table are the chrononauts, the chrononauts. Um, and that's futurists Edwin Gardner and Christian Fruneau, with an architecture background and a philosophy, sociology background, if I'm not mistaken. We'll get into that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you in this Designing Cities for All Fellowship are focused on rethinking the shape of trust and democracy in the digital age. And together with you and, and everyone here, we'll explore how we can build new architectures of trust in a changing world. And so in, in general, in the coming series, because it's a series of the coming four weeks, we'll focus on uh, what new architectures of trust look like. And today specifically, we'll be thinking about what does it architecture of trust look like for understanding truth, finding truth in the digital domain? How do we understand what is true? Because of course, as we all know, what, what I'm also very concerned about in this digital era is how more and more people are actually losing trust um, in the sources and the spheres that we used to kind of hold on to, uh, believe in like science and journalism. Um, and where are we heading now, actually? So we'll reflect on that uh, with the chrononauts and with three speakers. Um, I'm going to super briefly introduce you for now. We have Ayrenish Adabarkova. You're an investigative journalist and trainer at Bellingcat. I am. Yeah, very happy that you're here. Welcome. Thank you very much. We have Gwenda Nielen, the director of TILT, which is an organization that's countering disinformation and online manipulation. Super relevant as well. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, then online, we have Pedro Noel joining through Zoom, uh, who founded the nonprofit Associated Whistleblowing Press. Um, Pedro, are you here? 
just to yes, wave hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hi. You're a self-proclaimed meta-journalist, so I'm curious to, to learn what that profession uh, entails. Um, and of course, we welcome you in the audience here. Thank you so much for being here and also those watching at home. And we would love to include all of you in the conversation as well. So um, if you're at home and you have any questions, please go to menti.com and use the code 56170777. I mean, <laughs> you see it here as well. Um, and if you're in the room here, you can just raise your hand during the question rounds and uh, we'll uh, get your questions in. All right? Yes. Yes, great. Um, so let's dive uh, right in, first of all, with, with you guys, chrononauts. Chrononauten. Just use it interchangeably. Um, so Edwin and, and Chris. Can I say Chris or do you prefer Christian? What, it's up to you. Really? It is. Okay. <laughs> um, so the, in this today's conversation as I said we're discussing the digital public domain and truth finding um, why is this the first topic that you wanted to discuss in this series um, should I uh, yeah, yeah go, go for ahead. it um, well the program is called designing a public domain and I think the lack of, of the the growing social distrust you just mentioned. Uh, well, it's our premise that it's it's being it's partly caused by this disconnect between the emerging digital domain and uh, the old yeah and the older more closed up institutions that were formed in an earlier age. Mm, yeah. And what a healthy public domain does is it uh, it's a space where people come together and share information, order that information so that they can make decisions for the public good. That's one part. And the other one is uh, that it produces a sense of community, a sense of solidarity, a sense of belonging. So, and how the public space does those two things uh, informs uh, which and how the institutions that are built upon this yeah, information space uh, work and how it's how those are ordered. So we, so we thought. Well, first we're going to address the more the informational side of the public space, uh, which is basically how how do you understand truth? How do you order information? And and then next week we want to talk about uh, how it produces a sense of belonging, mm -hmm. uh, ideally, and how it not how it's not producing a sense of belonging these days. Uh, because of this disconnect. Um, and then, finally, we want to see if you have a functioning architecture of trust, what kind of institutions can you build upon that that are uh, yeah, relatable to a digital domain? Can I ask you about that, either one of you? This word or like the phrase architecture of trust, I mean, sounds great, but what do you mean by it? Yeah, well, I think... Um, an architecture of trust is basically, let's say, uh, the technologies, the culture, mm -hmm. uh, and processes you uh, kind of use to kind of have a certain ground truth in a society. Yeah. So, for instance, I don't know, if we are strangers and we don't, you know, trust each other yet on a kind of personal basis or if strangers have to do business together, the, yeah, the ground truth, or they, they can base their claims on paperwork, on contracts, on stuff that comes from the archive or the re registry. So that's kind of, let's say, the ground truth in our society today. And that makes it possible also to yeah, do uh, complex things in a society. We have a complex society, and it's possible because a lot of strangers can collaborate together because there's this ground truth that everybody can rely on. And that's, I think, what an architecture of trust, uh, yeah, kind of, uh, yeah, it's this kind of foundational structure on which you can build kind of complex societies. Do you think we have to have a ground truth, a common truth? 
I think it's not so much uh, a truth, but an understanding how truth is produced. So you have yeah. to have a common right. understanding of the method in which you produce truth. Yeah. I mean, you can uh, you cannot agree on the facts, but if you don't agree on the method that produces facts, then you have a real problem. Because what happens then? Well, then basically you you are distrustful. You you become distrustful towards the other. Interesting. So you don't have to even agree on the outcome necessarily. Oh, yes, no, because uh, scientists don't agree on so-called facts a lot of the time, but mm -hmm. they agree on the method that yeah. produces facts. Yeah. And a fact is not per se the truth. A fact is a datum that stands, that's an outcome of a certain process, a certain methodology. So it's uh, a fact is not the truth, but so you can disagree about that, but you cannot disagree on how you produce, how you produce truth. And that can be in a spiritual way, as long as everybody complies and everybody agrees, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you can have a common ground there. Yeah, yeah. But if you use a spiritual way to produce your worldview and your sense of reality, and I use a scientific way, yeah, then it becomes more difficult for us to um, yeah, cooperate together. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's, the, that's the point, right? If we don't find that then we don't trust each other and we can't get ahead we can't no, you solve anything else cooperate yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah what are you hoping for tonight in this conversation with these fantastic speakers we have well we hope to learn that's why mm. we're here yeah so, uh, it's basically also the whole program i mean we do a lot of research and make future scenarios uh, but we're not uh, like open source journalists or, uh, you know, so there's also a lot of things we're not. And our guests, they are. So we're here to learn. To basically. learn. Yeah, it's exchange ideas. Yeah. Great. Well, let me turn to the other speakers as well um, to understand who exactly we have at the table here and what perspectives we can, um, we can bring in. Eigenish. Uh, as I just said, you're an investigative journalist, you're a trainer at Bellingcat. And for those who don't know Bellingcat, it's a very, quite unknown, actually, award-winning international collective of journalists, open source investigators. That's all about advancing justice and transparency, if I'm, if I'm correct. Um, can you say a little bit about, about the collective, about the network? Mm -hmm. So yeah, what we do, as you've discussed, we do uh, open source research, we do open source investigations, and uh, uh, we try to do them as transparent as possible. So that's the key about Balancat, and uh, uh, we focus on uh, like variety of different topics. Uh, the worst are usually the most popular, but we also have lots. The like, worst are the most popular. Uh, the topics about war conflicts. Mm, yeah, the yeah, war. They get Ukraine. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Because, yeah, there is lots of... Um, because a lot of is going on during the war, but we also have investigations into uh, conspiracies, into corruption, and many different things. And this is, is possible uh, because we focus on open sources. So by open source, I mean... Uh, basically publicly available data on the internet. So social medias, uh, maps, uh, different open databases, and etc. Yeah. And I mean, you say it um, very easily, like open source, but can you say a little bit about what makes this type of journalism essentially different from other investigative journalists? Mm -hmm. So in traditional journalism, uh, journalists would, uh, yeah, would likely have a, like, a closed source where they would need to get some information and when they would publish it, basically their, um, their readers, they would have to uh, take their word for the fact. And uh, at Bellingcat, we, again, the, different, the biggest difference is transparency, that we show like, the sources that we use, that uh, readers could actually recreate these investigations. Mm. So you don't have to take our word for us. You can just recreate it and do your own research. Yeah. Right. Why is it called Bellingcat, actually? Oh, there is. Uh, a, a, it's a tale um, about the, how the mice are trying to uh, fight the cat. Not mm. fight, like, not die because of the cat. Right. And they figure out that the best way is to uh, put a bell on the on cat. On the cat, right. Yeah, so they gather up, but no one... Uh, 
decides to do it. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah, you're yeah. putting a bell on the cat. Yeah. yeah. And you also work as a trainer. Um, she has something in store for us later, actually, as well. But can you just briefly share, go, what do you teach people? Mm -hmm. So we basically teach everything that we know, uh, how we met it, like what open source is, how to do geolocations, how to search information about people, how to use different uh, social medias, and etc. So again, one of the ob objectives of Palancat is not only like producing these investigations, but uh, actually expanding the community, like mm. teaching them at it. So yeah, we don't get. Do you teach other journalists, or who who is in your? In your yeah. class. Yeah. There are lots of journalists, activists, and basically anyone interested. Mm. Yeah. Super interesting. But no government. Yeah. And no yeah. Except that. <laughs> and can you just briefly sketch like, some of the, what you said, like the war in Ukraine, for instance, a topic you investigate? Do you have other examples of like topics also that you personally maybe yeah, have definitely. investigated? Yeah. So Ukraine is one of them, but there is also, since I come from Central Asia, I come from Kyrgyzstan, there are also like, yeah, events that I'm uh, really interested in the region. So there was a like border conference like recently between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, and that's definitely interesting for me. So I'm gathering the facts, I'm like uh, geolocating and basically trying to like piece out what uh, has happened mm -hmm. and uh, yeah based on what is available on the internet using like satellite imagery and social media basically mm. and yeah there are also uh, conspiracy theories QAnon in Europe that I'm also interested in QAnon you know all about it yeah <laughs> you <Europe>, but <laughs> <laughs> what does that do to your brain to get into that stuff yeah it can be uh so Mental health is a very big topic at Valencat. What is? Mental health. Mental health, yeah. yeah. For just for you yourselves. Yeah, yeah. As for the yeah, for the stuff at the mm. organization. So when you're looking when you're looking at the war, like you're exposed to this uh, graphic content. Yeah. And it can affect your mental health. But there are also like this QAnon conspiracies and other conspiracies that you don't say anything graphic, but just the the things that they say, saying like, uh, I don't know, Russia is actually like saving Ukraine and telling like lots of lies, it can also affect you mentally. Yeah. So it's just, you kind of little bit lose like hope in humanity when you read those posts. Can so imagine. It's a, yeah, different mental health, I should say. And then you just make sure you take care of each other, give each other the yeah, definitely. space so to yeah. Vent about yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have the support system there. Right, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Really interesting. Uh Pedro, I would love to uh get you here. Hi. Um you are the founder, as I said, of the Associated Whistleblowing Press. Can you tell us a bit about that organization and how it came to exist? Yeah, sure. Um so hello everyone. Good night. Uh, so the Associated Whistleblowing Press was created in 2010 11 uh, in the epics of uh, the WikiLeaks phenomenon and all that. So, our idea was to decentralize uh, whistleblowing and localize uh, whistleblowing uh, and truth speaking in general. So, we saw the need to, yeah, to offer a, a, a platform that would have uh, like closer contact to communities. So they could speak up uh, about the problems that were affecting their their own lives and their own society, right? So basically, it was um, a network of um, whistleblowing platforms, let's say. So you would go to a website and then upload documents for journalists. So these platforms, they were composed by local newsrooms and local NGOs as well. So for example, we would go to Spain. Or uh, an alliance there made of like local newsrooms and local organizations there that would help us to reach that specific public and that would provide uh, trust in the platform because uh, the actors, let's say, uh, fooling and uh, the platform, they were already known actors uh, in that space. So, yes, so we, we got to build platforms in Iceland, in Spain. In Ecuador, we helped building the uh, one in Mexico, um, in Peru as well. Uh, so basically, that's it. It was basically a, uh, yeah, a big network of newsrooms connected through yeah through local platforms providing yeah with providing information, sensitive information. Is that, is that still what it what it is? 
You speak about it in as if it was that that's what it was. Is that still what it is, or has it invo- evolved yeah, into something else? We had to. We are not working on that anymore because I mean we had to. Yeah, each of us uh, went to different places. Basically, I created this with my colleague uh, Santiago Carrion in 2011. We both met in the um, university. We were both graduated in in philosophy. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah, and since then, yeah, I've been working with other things, with uh, more like research on this information uh, currently. Yeah, exactly. Because you call yourself a meta journalist, indeed. What does that entail? Yeah, right. Although it may sound fancy, it's not complicated at all. It's just basically doing research and doing journalism about the journalism itself. So it's basically yeah. studying how journalism is produced using journalistic uh, techniques. Yeah, very simple, actually. <laughs> Easy to explain, indeed. Um and, and do you have a certain way of working in that as a meta journalist or like a, yeah? So I think it's something very new. So we've been building actually like digital methods to try to evaluate, uh, yeah, how newsrooms they they choose what to cover the 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 reach of their coverage, uh, how th- these newsrooms they are. Um, affected by the by the feedback they receive from the right. public yeah uh in special like fact checks and all this uh how the impacts of fact checking they can be compared to the impacts of uh the disinformation pieces uh, themselves uh but basically as i said it's very new so we have to use um yeah a lot of machine learning analyzing social media posts analyzing and uh, news and uh, productions made by newsrooms making indexes trying to mm. rank them according to yeah their geography geographical situation according to their audience according to their uh, agenda let's say yeah interesting quite pioneering work indeed great thank you so much for for being here from that perspective as well thank you um our third and last guest here Gwenda Nealen as we said the director of Tilt, you can explain way better what your organization does. Uh, yeah, so um, we try to um, limit the impact that that information has on um, on society and on individuals. And on the one hand, so we monitor online narratives, networks, uh, phenomena like hate speech. Uh, and we try to make analysis of how certain disinformation campaigns are coming about and what impact it has on mm. people, how it is spread, if there was a certain intention, if there were bots involved or other techniques. So that is more like the monitoring insights um, side of the house. And then we also develop games. And with the games, we try to build resilience in different audiences so they become um, easy, so they can detect um, disinformation easier and they know... Um, well, how to navigate in a more safe way online. Mm. And, and here you can say it's like a, a sneak peek of several games we've developed, like Harmony Square is especially made to make you aware of how um, elections can be manipulated and what kind of narratives and emotional language then is used. And our newest cat park. And, and these so the bad news, and th- these are all freely available. Um, so the cat park, um, oh well, it gets you into a conspiracy story. And... Um, Interesting. Um, yeah. So really those two sides of, on the one hand, what you said, limiting the impact of disinformation, as in fake news, alternative facts, conspiracies, things going around. So you kind of take that as a given that's there and you try to limit the impact on yeah. people and society. Yeah, we're very much convinced like disinformation, manipulation, uh, propaganda, all these things, it has always been here. And as long as there's people with power and trying to gain more or more, more money, that it will always be there. Mm. So um, we feel like we cannot stop the whole um, online manipulation, but we can at least try to limit it and make people more resilient to yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we try to yeah, do. Yeah, with the games and with like yes. different ways to make really individuals, just people more resilient yeah. uh, in that or more, yeah equipped maybe to yeah because a lot of people think that they are not susceptible for disinformation or fake news or conspiracies uh but actually they are it's mm. because most of these stories are developed in a way that it uh, it has an unconscious impact and and people don't believe stories because of the story itself but it because it gives them a sense of belonging or it explains a certain situation it reduces uncertainty 
for instance, or um, it gives a certain a feeling of um, being able to actually do something together with, with a group of people yeah. and, and make a change. So it has a function, right. this information, and it's much more than the story itself. Yeah, it's not so much about the facts or the... No, well, definitely it's really not. About and in, the group and, and the in times of insecurity and uncertainty, um, the susceptil- susceptibility for disinformation uh, rises. Yeah, interesting. And you say we are more susceptible to it than we might realize because yeah. I think we also maybe often have a judgment of like a certain group of people is susceptible to online manipulation or. We see the same trend when people radicalize. It's not so much that you can define a certain characteristic in the people that radicalize, but it's the situation that they're in. Mm. Uh, that is what they have in common. What do you mean by that? Can you give so, an example? So um, people that are um, uh, in, in the trend of radicalizing or, 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 or being part of a cult, it's not that these people have something in common, like their cognition or something in their character. It is often that these people are in a place that they feel insecure or unheard or lonely, and that makes them susceptible to radicalize. Right, so radicalization. The social conditions. Yes, that is what they have in common. Right. Their situation more than their characteristics. Yeah, interesting. Nice. Um, so before we go deeper into this conversation... Um, the Chrononauts will take us on the, on a brief trip to the past so that we can look into the future. And again, if you have any questions during this program at home, please go to menti.com and use the code 56177077. Um, and you can ask your questions and I'll get them here. And everyone in the room, the question around, uh, raise your hand, as I said. Um, so let's listen to this interview with a media historian. Let's let's give him some uh, Edwin Gardner. Okay, let's see my uh, the first slide. Is it on? Yeah, there it is. But the clicker is. Uh... <laughs> the clicker is not working. Mm, no. Do we need to turn it on or do we? It worked earlier. Do I need to point somewhere? Okay, we're getting a helpline here. What conspiracy do we think this is caused Well, I can by? say uh, next. <laughs> yes, I, I'll say next. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Imagine, it's the year 2093. We find ourselves in a studio in an old warehouse on what at the beginning of this century was called the Piet Heinkade, but is now known as the Yo Moab Kade. Journalist Marty Markison and his camerawoman and sound engineer are setting up their gear for the third in-depth interview with Jopie Chef Arends, who is waiting patiently in a comfortable armchair looking over some notes. She is an impressive and ferociously smart media scholar who has changed how we view our information culture. Some even call her the Marshall McLuhan of the 21st century. Next. Once... Everyone in the studio is logged in and all equipment is running on chain. The conversation can begin. Are you ready? Asks Marty asks Yopi and Yopi nods. Okay, here we go. Marty turns to the camera and begins. Next. 100 years ago, in 1993, the internet, or rather the World Wide Web, opened to the general public and it radically changed the economy, politics, the public domain, and our lives forever. Before 1993, the computer was mainly a gadget in the corner of the room or in the attic. But with the birth of the web, the computer became the linchpin of the infrastructure on which our society runs today. Next. Yopi. 
How do you interpret this early period of the web? Next. Well, it was pretty crazy. But you actually see that with, every, with the introduction of every general purpose technology, be it the printing press, the steam engine, or the computer. Next. For the computer, the web was the tipping point. Um, isolated, it was primary, primarily a tool. Next. But when computers became networked, a completely new sphere of information emerged, a new digital domain that was increasingly undermining the old architecture of trust of the printed word. Next. So, Marty asks, so in what ways did the web undermine the architecture of trust of that period? Next. Well, in the beginning, of course, it was, was all quite innocent and mostly a playground for pioneers and dreamers who recognized the promise of digital technology and who started experimenting with projects and businesses. Next. Until from roughly the 2000s to the late 2010s, a number of those projects grew into huge platforms and figured out how to make enormous amounts of money with their network effects. At the time, this new information spheres uh, at the time this new information sphere started to undermine the then still dominant architecture of trust in a number of ways. Next, first, um, at the time, these platforms offered users radical new possibilities. For instance, users could look look up and check everything they wanted to know, but also everyone could directly publish into this new global information sphere and it became possible to do this at any and all times uh, from any place on the globe because everyone had this capability in their pocket with one simple gesture everybody had access to this new pub public domain next this is a very different for uh, very different from the public domain of the printed word where information was mostly one way and where publishers or broadcasters and their editorial boards determined what to publish, what to research, and which letters from readers were posted. Next. So the public had actually gained new superpowers that directly competed with the traditional broadcasters of news, knowledge, and policy. All kinds of new voices and sources and ideas were flooding unhindered into this public space. The amateur those who published for the love of it, could bypass professional editors and journalists and build audiences all on their own. Next. Then, secondly, the platforms on which these new rivers of public information and discourse started flowing were run by a handful, handful of monopolies, which meant that they were determining the rules of engagement in this new domain. Rules that were informed by commercial interests that manipulated the dynamics of this public domain in a complex and fine-grained way in order to retain user attention and to sell ads. And spectacle and emotions were better for this than reflection and considerate dialogue, a logic that started to fragment and polarize society. Next. Okay, I get the picture you paint of the wild web during the early part of this century. But perhaps you could elaborate a little more on the older architecture of trust and why it couldn't withstand the digital revolution. Next. Ah, good question. First, let's clarify what I mean by architecture of trust. You can understand an architecture of trust as a structure that provides a kind of ground truth that allows parties to co cooperate and trust each other without knowing each other personally. Such an architecture is a prerequisite for participating in large complex societies, organizations and projects involving thousands if not millions of people. Next. In those days, when you did not trust each other on a personal basis or when strangers had to do business with each other, they relied on printed documents. In other words, printed paper documents with signatures, stamps, dates and multiple copies in multiple archives to secure trust. This development of this information technology, of course, started with Gothenburg's printing press. And over a period of 500 years, this resulted in the development of a completely new information culture, from which a, uh, from which a new form of organization, the bureaucracy, 
and a new work ethic, that of the prof professional, emerged. Two crucial ele elements in the architecture of trust of the printed word. Next. I define a bureaucracy as a set of methods and culture that use the printed word to coordinate complex organizations, like, for example, governments, ministries, corporates, and NGOs. The bureaucracy is based on a ground truth of paper trails that everyone in the organization relies on, which means that if something is not on paper, it de facto does not exist, at least not in the eyes of the organization. In order to produce this paper ground truth, there are protocols, which are also recorded on paper, that you can think of as the operating system of a literate organization. And of course, running a bureaucratic operating system is again a requirement for doing business in a complex literate society. Next. And then the professional. The professional animates the bureaucratic machine. But this is only possible if the professional acts objectively and rationally. Next. In other words, when the professional goes to work, he leaves his subjectivity at home and is expected to behave business-like, zakelijk, or professionally. Of course, this is an ideal picture, a model, because we all know man is not a machine that makes perfectly rational decisions. Next. Man generally takes with him all his prejudices, life experience and culture, and this uh, consciously or unconsciously colors his action, actions. Next. Nevertheless, the culture of professionalism was rooted in the idea that uh, you were loyal to your professional code of conduct and to your organizations. Doctors, lawyers, scientists, and journalists were expected to act according to the ethical framework of their profession. A framework that uh, had professional bodies, disciplinary chambers, and other supervisory organizations uh, that were supposed to check these professionals if they were working like they should. Next. That sounds pretty exotic and alien, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Next. Because today, of course, we live in a very different reality, where trust is secured by public data chains, where we ourselves are owners of our data and identity and the network effects are public. Next. Absolutely. But also the architecture of trust today, that of the activated world, has been built up step by step. Next. I... Um, I've already mentioned the exper uh, experimental pioneering phase of the 1990s and the wild web of the 2000s that came after. In the early 2020s, the third phase started. Uh, the digital monopolies still reigned supreme, made outrageous amounts of money, and their platforms played a leading role in creating division, sowing hatred, and spreading dis- and misinformation. To the point that in some democracies, election results were no longer recognized by large swaths of the population. On top of that, several whistleblowers revealed how technology companies and their business models played a fundamental role in the creation of an unhealthy public sphere. To put uh, a stop to this, the US began breaking up platform monopolies and the U EU introduced legislation that forced large platforms to become interoperable with smaller parties. In addition, a wave of digital de decentralization technologies created a new generation of platforms that smartly took advantage of the new interoperability requirements. Suddenly, it became clear to many people that the web could also be very different. This new confidence was also fueled in Europe by the introduction of the European Digital Identity Wallet in which citizens could securely keep their passports, diplomas and all sorts of other official documents and have complete control over who could access their data and identity. An ID that allowed them to access everything online, or rather, rather on-chain, by uh, on-chain. By the late 2020s, the new public data chain infrastructure, the Universal Data Commons, became increasingly important in securing trust. Carbon accounting, ESG compliance, transparent supply chains, open science, open journalism, open voting could all happen now on-chain. 
It ensured that decisions, evidence, sources and data could be verified by anyone without compromising the privacy of citizens. This infrastructure proved to be much needed because more and more of the information users were interacting with no longer came from human hands. GenTech, short for generative tech, wrote texts, created images, composed music, and engaged in conversations that were indistinguishable from human origins. Knowing which information was created by whom or what, and produced where and when, became essential to having any confidence at all in what was presented to an audience. Uh, Marty, if you had to make an analogy between these old and new architectures of trust, could you say that the old bureaucratic organizations played the same role as the public chain platforms of today? And to extend the an analogy that the role of professionalism has been replaced by algorithms and machine intelligence that animate the public chain and facilitate our interactions with it? Next. Yes, in a sense, your analogy is correct. Because after all, the big difference between the printed word and the activated word is that the printed word needs humans to come alive and to do work, whereas the activated word comes alive in a machine. It is thus both the information, the organization, and the worker. Next. The architecture of trust of the activated word has therefore also created uh, the space for a new work ethos, that of craftsmanship instead of professionalism an ethos that is still based on a kind of ethical framework and professional honor, but without the strong emphasis on formality and objectivity, because these tasks have been delegated to the chain. And this allows us today to be very personal and informal in our work, focusing more on the intrinsic value of work itself rather than having to embody protocols and perform procedures. Next. With the exception that we have to decide uh, with which interactions we want to, want to put on or off chain. Next. Yes, but we experience this very differently from when people used to put things online. Today we experience putting things on chain as protecting ourselves and keeping our data safe. While at the beginning of the century many felt uncomfortable or slightly paranoid about doing anything online. It was like a devil's bargain. You could get the new superpowers of the digital age age but you would pay by putting all your data in a place that was completely beyond your control next on that note thank you very much Jopie. next let's conclude our on-chain conversation uh, here and enjoy a well-deserved off-chain drink at the bar next that's a wrap says the cameraman and the studio goes off chain nice Yeah, that was fantastic. Okay, good. Yeah, every, and you drew every picture yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Indeed, we want to clap extra for that. <laughs> yeah, but that actually really helps us understand. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty abstract uh, stuff to uh, wrap your head around. Yeah. Uh, especially. Yeah, trying to kind of understand, let's say, the old architecture of trust. Yeah, I mean, we know it very well and it has a history. But of course, exploring what this new architecture of trust could be. Uh, yeah, it's a challenging one. And it's also where Chris and me, we're continuously researching and making scenarios and kind of figuring out, yeah, what could it be? So we see all kinds of trends and technologies that could perhaps help us with that. But it's also a search. So we also... How does yeah. it come together? Yeah. yeah, how does it come together? So we see elements and we see a need because, yeah, our current trust model isn't working very well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, then, of course, is this the way it should be or not? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we're curious what our guests exactly, think about Exactly, yeah. And Gwenda and Eigenish and Pedro, I'm, I'm really curious just like, What's listening to the scenario? What is it? What key thoughts does it bring up for you? Yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, I we, we see the same thing um, happening. That 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 trust is declining, and not just trust in in 
in systems or in governments, but also trust between people and even trust in people's own capabilities to be online and do banking or, I mean, there is online crime, there is so much danger, so even people feel reluctant to interact. And then you see that the most, like the polarized voices come out. And and I like this idea of the chain. Uh, it brings it back to a more of like a collaboration. Um, and, and I think that will facilitate the middle ground to get back um, in the uh, in the online spaces because I think a lot of uh, from the perspective of how people communicate and um, which is more and more hateful and polarized, it has the effect that the the gray middle ground is kind of disappearing. Yeah, so back to that ground truth actually. That and and I feel like if we could bring it back to um, bring back trust in, in this way, it will um, also bring a lot of people back that bring the nuance between yeah the extremes Eichanish, what did it bring up for you i think quite similar things i completely agree with you that uh yeah polarizing is a huge problem nowadays and maybe this model would actually also like help uh get us to the middle ground get us to the truth so yeah mm. pedro i like the idea of the the chain i just um I'm just a bit afraid of uh, if there is just one chain, wouldn't this be a bit uh, centralized? Or we are talking about many and uh, an ecosystem of chains that connect to themselves. And then I'm also a bit afraid of an idea that technology can help, can solve things. I think technology can help to solve things, but I think the, act the actual issues are more like political and social than uh, technological. Mm, maybe the corona nuts can, can react to yeah, these think, concerns. I, th I think your first concern is is very, that's a very good point. I mean, if you put everything on, on, on a centralized chain or even if this chain is very resilient and uh, yeah, I mean, it's a vulnerability, a vulnerability. On your second point, I think our main um, insight was researching it, that the public domain, that we, we're not living in the first, this is, I mean, we, we like to think of ourselves as living in an information society, but modernity, so let's say the culture that emerged 600 years ago, was also an, an, an information society. It, it was based on the printing press, on the mass publication or the mass pr production of, of information, which wasn't possible before that. And also they had to use technology to, to organize trust. And their technologies were sort of combination of, of yeah, real technologies, let's say physical technologies and social technologies. I mean, the professional, the ID, the work ethos that it's called professionalism is very much an invention and it's a technology and it forces people in a sort of format that, that generates trust in the client. Um, so you have this sort of professional client situation that produces trust because the client thinks the professional will act in a certain manner, in a so certain taking impersonal on that manner. Professional role is yeah. already a and social I think, technology. Exactly. And I think if you if you understand that it's a technology, it's a social technology, and there's so completely uh, I mean what the professional actually did I mean, probably he did a lot of stuff that were very against his ethos, but the trust was to a certain part still there. And so I, yeah, for us it's, so the public domain now shifts towards a new information technology. And I think part of the solutions are again, technological. Yeah. In a way, even if it's soft technology or social technology or it's it's a chain like this but yeah i mean even the printing press is a technology and the spoken word is also in a way a sort yeah. of technology so i, I think I, I mean i understand your reluctance but if you look back we're living in in a technological age since I mean, the first guy you're or woman you're, you define up technology a stick. Yeah. as wider, maybe than what we now understand as yeah, I think as technology that in that sense. I think that clarifies things. Yeah, 
I would think is that like the yeah, speed and scope of uh, the change has been increased a lot and and the thing is like how can we have the people change as fast as well because people had quite some time to adapt yeah. to the printed uh, word uh, and now this goes so fast and people's behavior and their um, awareness and knowledge about it's become so complex so our challenge is also like how can we keep the people um yeah, yeah, uh, and get them along and, the and, at the same and, pace. Yeah. C- going I, back to the yeah. scenario, I want to ask uh, the speakers: Is anything missing from what you're hearing, from your perspective? Is something missing in this? I would say there's a lot to add. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very positive way of framing it. What's like a very important thing to add? Well, I think trust has a lot to do with identity and authority as well, and and the and um, uh, being anonymous on, uh, on on the information space we have now makes and provides a lot of space for manipulation and harm and mm-hmm. and not taking responsibility and accountability. So I would say it would help a lot if the chain idea would facilitate more transparency or at least accountability. So you can only be there right. if it's you. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Pedro, maybe? What is missing? So don't get me wrong. I think that it's, a, it's a very nice idea, but not that it's missing, but something to add. <laughs> no one wants to say what's missing. As well. It's okay. That's why uh, we're here. We're here to like learn. complete yeah. it together. Yeah. And thanks for the comments, because now we understand that uh, you consider culture as also technology. So, yeah, so then uh, I I concede that then technology could be a solution as well. (laughs) But um, coming to the the point, um, so I think there is there is not missing, but I would add, let's say, the the political dimension of that. Right. Because for a chain like this to exist, there needs to be like, let's say, a a global agreement between uh, major uh, stakeholders in the mar- in the industry, in the governments, in civil society, and etc. Right. So just the presentation was taken for granted that this type of agreement would already exist in order for us to be able to have a a, a validation, a global validation chain, for example. Yeah. And could, could we then have like a decentralized system of um, monitoring and interventions, like the people? Um, from certain expertise of backgrounds together um, decide on, based on, um, um, as you say, like a common ground of what we find acceptable, like a blockchain kind of idea of controlling or ruling this whole environment. That yeah. is- I am well, working I mean, on that. Uh, we should have a talk after this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but I, we're, we're here to have this talk, Pedro. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's, I mean, it's not that different, I think, with how other uh, internet technologies came to be. So if you look at kind of the, the part of the stack that was made in the 90s, this, this is all open source and public technology, HTTP, TCP, IP, the web browsers, like a lot of uh, HTML, uh, so I think if you, I mean, now we look at a lot of the web and we see like the commercial uh, mayhem, let's say, mm-hmm. but actually there's a lot of public and open source infrastructure uh, that runs this and also, uh, let's say, public and non-profit organizations where these protocols and ideas are uh, developed. So yeah. I think in a way the framework to develop this uh the is predecessor there. is there. Arhanish, is I w- sorry, I, w- oh. I would love to hear from you because the same question of what do you feel? And you can be super honest, like what, what might be missing? So my question was, in this case, if everything is uh, on chain, would we, uh, open source researcher, would be able to access the information and then do our research? Yeah, so... Because it's like secured yeah. away. Mm. Maybe because there's a lot of questions now, so... What do you mean? Yeah. Well, she had like a question about identity and uh, how that works on the chain. So maybe we should... Go one by one, you mean? Yeah, yeah I but guess. I want to make sure that we, we include yeah, your yeah, points in the conversation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, with the idea is, yeah, your data is on the chain. Uh, but yeah, on chain is not the same thing that it's immediately published or online. Um, 
and yeah, how this data is uh, disclosed to the public uh, yeah, determines on, let's say, for instance, the participants in this uh, studio production with the four people involved. Um, let's say, how they agree on uh, releasing it. But I think the, um, yeah, there is, a let's say, a public record of these things. So if it goes, for instance, if this interview goes live and is published, everybody can retrace when it was made, find the original files, and in a way, so it's in a way the opposite of what, let's say, a traditional journalistic institution does, which actually says, uh, like, for instance, the NOS, you know, it publishes a news article. There's often no author. There's no links or sources. You have to trust the journalistic brand and their professionalism, right? And I think this, ideally, it should exactly facilitate, yeah, the kind of practice of Bellingcat that you have any citizen can retrace, okay, there's a piece here, okay, where, and then you can, let's say, find how it links to this public chain, and you can, okay, the original interview, the audio files, who was there, and you have actually a but record. do of we mm -hmm. see any tension here between, indeed, the security aspect and the transparency aspect, which you're I'm raising, actually, yeah. Yeah, I'm seeing, actually, another uh, issue that could be possible, what if you like post something and then you decide that oh this is actually sensitive information and I shouldn't have posted it but it's already been out there somebody maybe reshared it and it goes on what happens in that case because it's also the security so these cases have happened in uh, uh, Ukraine for example people do take uh, like lots of videos and stuff but when the uh, city gets occupied by Russian, uh, like Russian military, there might be consequences for these people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then it's already in the chain. Yeah. So how yeah, do you... Yeah, but I, what I think is interesting, you can... Um, uh, so if you if you decide to publish something and then you don't, uh, what if, if somebody like copy-paste it or, or whatever, then it's a piece of information without an actual author because the author is in the chain and which is blocked. I think that mm -hmm. such a thing could happen. I don't know. So I'm, then I'm also reaching here. But and, and the other point is that uh, if you you can, in, in a chain like this or in a data commons like this, you can uh, authenticate uh, uh, sources uh, and you can uh, certify f sources. So third parties can also certify certain sources. Um, sources so ideally then you create if if you have open science and, and open journalism you create like open chains of evidence that you can follow um yeah. i have some and if somebody goes if something goes offline then you can ask the question okay why did you do that and there can be a statement for instance or yeah maybe there are reasons for it yeah to go a bit, little bit deeper into several of these points, uh, some questions to, to each of the speakers as well. Um, Pedro, first of all, I mean, what we're talking about now, right? This like this type of architecture of trust, this chain of evidence um, that in a scenario is a condition for a more healthy uh, public domain for being able to move forward. Do you think that is indeed a condition or do you think there's like whole other ways to have a more healthy public domain yeah that's a good question i thank you <laughs> but probably there are other other ways right i mean i haven't given um i haven't thought about it like in in in, in depth like about a specific uh solution um so i think one consideration is that of central of central Central, extreme centralization, even if it's uh, on a chain, then I don't think we we are not mature enough as a culture to 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 establish a common ground for truth, uh, not only for object truth objects, right? Or, because they don't exist. Basically, there's no objectivity in this sense. But also, not uh, we're not still made mature enough to establish the um, the methods uh, through which we uh, we would achieve this truth, and then, I mean, the facts, right? So if you say a fact-based truth, even if it's a fact-based truth, 
but the facts you cannot take these facts in an isolated way right because mm -hmm. truth is a is a construction made of different facts so we have to select facts to build the truth uh, we want so i would just have a step back maybe and before uh thinking about a, a specific model I would say there should be an agreement about um, the, the the matter of this truth that we want to promote or this truth that we want to build this common ground common ground upon. Right, and you're saying we have not reached a maturity level to decide that together. Exactly, I I, I would say that that now maybe what would be more safe would be to to promote spaces and uh, to build this uh, a common idea and a common methodology or a common interest uh, for truth, right? Because it's in some way, the way we are doing now, it's, it's a bit arbitrary, right? We, we are selecting and building truth mm -hmm. based on different parameters without a specific agreement on what should be these parameters. Right. Man, there's so much to think about here. Also, to, to kind of ground it a bit more again, Gwenda, um, I mean, this this chain of evidence type thinking um, is a way to to teach people again what is true or not, right? Like, what is what is truth? What can we take as as truth? Um, and I mean, I wonder if, if you have used this type of thinking in how you design your games and also just in general, does that, does, can that work? Is that, is, you know, and how do you then make people see that indeed, okay, this is the truth. It's now in this chain. So it's the truth. It's, it's about people's perception. Mm -hmm. So um, how do we get people to also accept that what's in there is the truth because there have always been uh, conspiracy thinking and um, science denial and a system will probably not change because people um, follow these movements or, or um, these beliefs because it provides them a sense of identity and belonging and a system in itself I mean a, a technology um, I'm, I'm not sure how we can make everything begins and ends with how people behave mm -hmm. Uh, and um, uh, and that is based on how they perceive their reality. And even if you present it in a way that is obvious to the common ground, to most people, that this is the truth, there will always be people that are trying to find a way around. Or um, and and yeah, so that that is what I'm thinking. Like how uh, maybe we should also accept that we can never build or get to a point where everyone is in the same um, truth system mm -hmm. or truth but architecture. But that, that is the, the desire or the wish yeah. with this, uh, you know, public data chains that you actually do create something where people are all can see like, okay, th this is, you know, like, yeah, it, it, it against polarization, against like everyone everyone's individual idea of what's true or not but then you're yeah, saying but that, that is like, what, 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 to... what Pedro was saying like I think also on we should invest more on how people come to um, what they believe is true yeah so have them much more uh, teach much more skills as self-reflection um, right. Um, philosophy uh, but also um, um, skills Right. Um, on, on, for instance, um, uh, truth finding and media literacy, a kind of, I think we should put a lot more uh, sources and, um, um, and, and money in making, at least starting with the next generation. And that's what Pedro also maybe means by maturity of yeah. ourselves. Like if we have more self-reflection, if we are more able, uh, yeah, th to understand like how we work ourselves yeah especially because one of the problems is polarization I, I believe and 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 people are not so much aware on 
how this happens. It's because your brain works, emotional language, it triggers you more. Yeah. And we have a, a, a preference for binary oppositions because it's much more easy to comprehend. And we like to have a story in which there's a bad guy and a good guy, in which, of course, we're in the good part and we can do something against the bad ones. So there is a lot of... Um, 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 a cognitive mm. like mechanisms like yeah. the illusory, illusory truth effect if we see the same message popping up uh, from different sides we believe it's true yeah. it has nothing to do it's the way it's presented so I think if people know are more aware of how your brain works how perception comes about and what that does to how you behave in the end yeah, exactly. and make people more resilient I, I truly believe that and as uh, better said more yeah. oh well, yeah, yeah, I was I was wondering also with like open source investigations, how uh, because yeah we associate like uh, let's say a lot of conspiracy thinking with uh, uh, extreme right. So I'm wondering because of course the idea is if you have a public chain or if you have a public process, for instance Wikipedia is of course also a good example. Um, does that also let's say work across the political spectrum? Uh, so, for instance, I don't know, within Bellingcat, it's like like the people who work there, are they in general like left-leaning? Or do you have also, let's say, people like approaching, doing the open source work like seriously and rigorously, but from, let's say, other convictions or wanting to reveal other things and using the exactly the same toolkit? Mm -hmm. So with the Bellingcat, yes, I'd say most of us are more left-leaning, but still, it doesn't mean that we are not going to do investigations in the, I don't know, the West wrongdoing, the U.S. wrongdoing, we still do that. But we can also, yeah, to, uh, uh, as an example, we have seen that QAnon communities are actually using open source methods. They are using like flight tracking websites, Google Maps to, uh, uh, to jump to their conclusions. And the difference is that, that, that they're not necessarily, yeah, they're not doing the correct way. And what they are doing, they're trying to fit the facts into their story, while uh, we are trying to teach people, like, like actually t uh, let the uh, facts tell the story. So this is the difference, let's say. But is then there, like, for instance, if you engage with them, and say, yeah, you can do it. So, I mean, because there is, a, a, like, a kind of, uh, they want to do this method, and they've, ah, I figured something out, I've learned something. So you would think then they're susceptible at least, okay, like to the to how rigorous is your method to make a to come to something objective, let's say. Yeah, I'd say they're not that interested in it, unfortunately. Mm. So when they're doing the research in the comments, they're always like people saying like, "Hey, actually, this doesn't work like that," and etc. And they don't really take it that into consideration. And I guess it is also comes to again what you've been saying, like uh, like people haven't like uh, matured enough or. They uh, have not really thought through how to, in this case, like use this tool exactly. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to, yeah, like publishing our guides and like explaining how to do stuff to exactly like show the world that this, this can be done and this is the ways. But still, we have so many like conspiracies about mm -hmm. Bellingcat being like completely funded by, I don't know, governments and like our digital process being controlled and et cetera. Right, yeah. Before we go into a quick question around with the audience, uh, maybe as a last question for now, I mean, in the scenario, there was one example posed of, you know, a new architecture of trust that can help us build a more healthy, more, more safe public domain. Um, but what do you think more in general should be uh, design principles and criteria for any new architecture of trust? that could help us build a more healthy and more safe public domain. Some of the, yeah, some of the general principles, design principles, criteria that we need to have in place. Do no harm. Do no harm. B would you want to elaborate? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, in essence, I feel like um, um, even though a lot of... Um, the way information is used is not intentionally doing harm, but it does in a way. So um, I think we should also make uh, 
an information or an environment or an ecosystem in which you can also be accountable if you do harm, even if it wasn't yeah, intended. Yeah, exactly. That intended. we don't accept that there is a collateral damage from... Yeah, and, yeah. and that, that in a way we can make that visual. Or I, don't, I don't know. It, it, uh, I feel like this is... It's used... But uh, this is also my... <laughs> Uh, how do you say this? My tunnel vision from the work I do, I see so much horrible things that maybe you recognize mm. um, that that is especially something I would like to have as a principle, do no harm. Yeah, thank you. But I think harm can also be like very uh, object, uh, subjective. Yeah, you're because subjective. Because like yeah. COVID disinformation, they believe that they're actually doing the good stuff, like telling the world that vaccines are bad and etc. So that's an interesting way. Yeah, harm to whom, yeah. Yeah, so... For me, it would be like stay curious and stay open minded. Mm -hmm. Stay curious. Yeah. So try like being open minded, try to find like what is out there and like don't fixate on what you think. So. What you think, you know, is true. Yeah. yeah. And then the, to add, that would be like do falsification instead of verification. What do you mean by that? Uh, I think in science, it's a very well-known um, way of doing research is you always find, you try to find falsification and until you find it, then it's true. It's not, with verification, you can prove anything. Yeah, there's always an example. There. There's always, right, so. and that uh, is what conspiracy thinkers are always also doing. So maybe we should um, teach people on a very small scale how to use falsification more instead of verification. Yeah, thanks. Pedro? No, I agree. I would. I was up to say the same. I think this. What I would. Yeah, my take is that this structure or this design should have as principle. Uh, should should foster criticism over the the design itself. Can you say that again? Foster criticism over the the, the, the the design should foster a criticism against the the design itself. So right, it should right. uh, give incentive to criticism of the structure itself. Right, so kind of as a feedback loop on the design. Yes, which is about uh, what you said about the falsification, which is a, a note, um, Karl Popper idea that's yeah, the theories and pro or, uh, they are stronger when they are um, easier to be falsified. Yeah, yeah, great. As a little in between uh, harvest, Edwin and Chris, do you have any new information? Uh... Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I think some things. So next week we're we're using this chain ID to see how it uh, produces standards mm -hmm. on which platforms can be built. So platforms can be interoperable and will function in a totally different economic system. Um, and people will log in with their chain, so they will be. Yeah, it it will be more it will be less anonymous. Yeah. So there will be less hiding uh, because a public space obviously needs recognizable members of the public. I if not, you don't have a public space. So, um, yeah, that's partly... I, I, I do agree a lot with... Um, and that's not obviously addressed here, but I do agree a lot with there needs to be a lot of um, education Right, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there needs to be a totally different cultural attitude towards truth, towards truth finding, towards uh, media, um, how do you say it? Media Constantly. literacy. Yeah. And, uh, but on the other hand, you need a structure in which facts or, or sources, because facts, I don't, I don't believe so much in facts, but in sources became become transparable and become available to everyone. I think a, a lot of what Bellingcat also does. Yeah. And I think it, it's it's a dual process. Yeah, exactly. Um, Edwin, for you, yeah. any anything to add? Just as a super in-between. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, <laughs> I was just wandering off a bit, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're just spacing out, okay. Luckily, no, there's maybe, a re maybe recording. Maybe not, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, I think still uh, what I'm also s struck with what you said, like st because you know the the conspiracy thinker or the because you look for belonging, so so yeah, of course groups are looking for something else than facts or yeah. truth or yeah. right, 
So I think that's still uh, like a kind of question which lingers. Yeah, because it has a function indeed. It's not just there for nothing. Well, yeah, so I think this structure could like, uh, let's say, cultivate a, a broader change. And that's, uh, I think, also the, the hard part of this discussion. So this polarization is growing nowadays. Mm -hmm. It is related with this information transition we're in from, from printed to digital. Um, but then again, it's kind of hard to explain. Ah, now we have a chain and the polar. So it's like a, a very yeah. indirect race. So it's very hard to kind of yeah. somehow connect, say, yeah, the chain will somehow do that. Yeah, exactly. And that's something like, okay. All right, but that's, this is so good. Do. Still processing. Still processing. Any questions from you here? About any of anything that's been discussed? Yeah, go ahead. About, oh, I've been thinking all the time about the role of money in this whole mm. uh, future uh, uh, platform. Because the people who have a lot of money right now are in charge of these Facebooks and Twitter, for example, right, last week. Uh, but do you see the money still in the system or you see it all the way? Well, of I think I think part of the attraction of a system like that, like a like a connected set of data faults, data commons, is that your data, my data, is not in the hands of the moneyed class. So now uh, all our data is in the hands of Amazon or Microsoft. It's it's stored on their servers. Uh, and uh, most of it is used for AI training and for advertisement sales and for all kinds of stuff that you don't give permission to and which makes them richer in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so if, if, if the social economic system will change, well, that's a really big question. Um, I think on a very small scale, Money can be embedded in the chain, and I don't mean cr crypto uh, coins. I just mean just uh, public uh, currencies. Public currencies. currencies. Um, and, and well, connected perhaps also what Pedro said about uh, the social economic side of it. Um, I do think that, especially in the European Union, and although they don't have a clue what they're doing because they don't think about the public domain, but they think about how to stop the, the monopolies. But they do produce a lot of laws. And they do take action. And they're actually working on comparable systems uh, like the chain. Yeah. Um, so there is a movement towards this. And I think... It's an interesting movement, and we should think about it and, and support it and make it better. And that's a the any, yeah. any brief additions from our speakers on the, m the money question, the interests, the greed? It will be hard to keep it out. I mean, there's always a way to uh, monetize um, good initiatives. I mean, that's happened with the Internet as we know it now as well. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. And, and by design, this should somewhere be integrated. In the principles, yeah. exactly. Yes, yeah. I agree. Like how do you yeah. keep but this I think democratic? Like one yeah. thing, the, for instance, the, the European legislation that's coming now, the, the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, they are like kind of pointed towards like disempowering the monopolies. But I think there is, for instance, like that I know, above uh, a certain user count, uh, 75 million, I think, platforms are forced to become interoperable. And I think there, so there's a, and that's also a bit what I speculated with yeah. in the scenario. So on the one hand, you see under the banner of Web3 and, and blockchain and stuff, all kind of decentralized stuff coming up. And on the other hand, you see like the EU forcing big tech to open up. Yeah, And I think there's a potential uh, because uh, Cory Doctorow, for instance, talks about this idea of adversarial interoperability. So because, for instance, Facebook will be forced to become interoperable, certainly you can much more easily port users to the... Because you can keep 
still keep talking and in touch with everybody still on Facebook. So it's taking away the network effects. And I think that's why a lot of people are staying on these platforms. Yeah, yeah your friends are there, your data is there. And I think if yeah. you start like Opening attacking the up. network effects and kind yeah. of making them more public, I think this kind of shift could start happening. Yeah. Uh, and at the We're same time, we, to, see, um, we see that regulating platforms, uh, regulating themselves, doesn't work. No. Yeah. So no. that also needs to be. I'm going to in a pause us here because we have a really exciting part of the evening coming up, oh. and that is our fact check training with Aichanish. Um, that's all I'm going to say about it. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Shh. Do I stay here? Mm. I guess. Okay. <laughs> I think we're going to get instructions on that. Whatever you prefer. Yeah, yeah, I can stay here. Yeah? Okay, yeah. great. So, yeah, uh, now I'm going to give you an example of open source research. Uh, this um, case study of what we've done before. And give you just basically an idea what uh, we do and that you can actually also do that. That Yeah, as it's, it's not a rocket science, as has been said before. So yeah, here you'll have an example of uh, locating ISIS supporters. In 2016, if you remember, there was a huge campaign by uh, ISIS supporters in Europe to post photos with, of, with a note saying like, hey, I'm an ISIS supporter and with uh, some background. You could see that it was clear enough to see that it's probably yes in Europe, probably in this city, but not clear enough to uh, like find exactly where it is. So yeah, lots of ICE supporters started posting these photos on Twitter and uh, it got, of course, lots of uh, panic on the internet. So yeah, here's uh, uh, one of those. If you go to the next slides. Yeah, so this is the tweet that was posted. And here it says that uh, like I'm an ICE supporter and I'm in uh, Münster, uh, Germany. So we wanted to find the exact location where this um, where this photo was taken. So can you tell me, uh, yeah, basically what you see and how you could find that? Yeah, just anything that you see. Traffic lights. Yeah, there are definitely traffic lights over there. And was it does it tell you about the road? Yeah, there's bus driving, so probably, uh, it, yeah, the traffic lights will be telling you that there is a crossroad there, right? And uh, yeah, what else can you see? Line of the bus, I see bus looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> there's a number on the bus. I think uh, you can find the route the bus is taking, I think, if you ask me. Yeah, that'd be great, but unfortunately this photo was posted on Twitter and the quality was very low. But could the bus tell you if it's Munster? In Germany the number plates are uh, starting with the first letters of the city, I, I sort of... Mm -hmm. But again, like low quality low image. Quality. Oh, you tell me. Yeah, any other options? Yeah, definitely. So we could go just Google like Münster buses and there you could see that, yep, Münster buses actually look like this. It could be, of course, possible that in whole Germany they're the same buses, but here at least it confirms that, yep, it could be a Münster. So yeah, what else can you see? The shade, maybe? Yeah, there is a huge shade. What do you think, Dallas? Yeah, it could be that there is a, or uh, under a bridge that's maybe also the pillar or there is a big, big um, a building close by. Because maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Maybe the ad. Yes, the ad. Uh, so there's the ad. Unfortunately, we couldn't read anything. And at that point, we were quite lost where this is. And we posted on Twitter asking like, hey, does anyone know where this is? And the German person actually wrote commented that in Germany, all of these advertisement stalls, uh, you can find them on this website, okay? And if you go to the next page, so yeah, it turns out there is this website with all of the ads. And uh, uh, if you go to the next one, yeah, you can see there are like hundreds of them. And uh, we decided uh, that we wanted to figure out where exactly this photo was taken. So what we do uh, to quickly go through each of them, we go to satellite imagery and quickly check out if what we've seen matches, okay? 
So if we go back to the original image again. Mm -hmm. So in a little bit, I'll show you a few examples of the satellite imagery and you would need to tell me like if it's the place, okay? So please look uh, at the photo again, taking all the details. So you've already said about the shadow, the ad, the, um, the lights, and the, uh, the crossroad. Anything else that you see? The broken up uh, sidewalk. Mm -hmm. The buildings in the back look like yep. a residential neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. There are buildings. And there's in a the park back. or green, like some trees. Mm -hmm. And there are some trees. Okay, let's go further to the. Uh huh. Oh, did they display all? Oh, okay. So let's focus only on uh, on the first one. Okay. So these are the six examples. Okay. Take. Yeah. Let's let's just start with the first one. Do you think it could be the first one? Uh, the green uh, square means that that's where the ad is. Oh yeah. Mm. No. 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 Why do you think it's a no? No traffic lights. No traffic lights. Okay. Does everybody agree? And there's a curved, a, a curved road. Mm hmm What about the second one? Second one being like the one in the middle top. No. It's the green. Mm hmm All right. What about the third one? Yeah, there's no building. Mm hmm There is no building that should be able to see. Yeah. There is a crossroad, but do you think it could be the crossroad still on the third one? Too what? Yeah, maybe too far away. Okay. What about the fourth one on the corner left bottom? Yeah. No, I think that's the that's one. That's the one, maybe. Okay. What about you? Can you, if you have an answer, please raise your hand so the mic can come to you. I thought the building was uh, in a different position, but can could be uh, the the place. Okay. There's okay. a lower building over mm. there in the corner. Mm -hmm. That sort of IFDID matches the uh, the shape of the uh, building you see. So not the high rise on the corner, but mm -hmm. the one a bit lower, perhaps. All right. Okay. What about the next one? The fifth. What do you think? But it's a roundabout. There's no traffic lights. And it's yeah. on the other side, right? Or or can a photo also be mirrored? It could be. Yeah. But yeah. But yeah, it's a roundabout and, and there is no traffic light. What about the last one? No crossing. No traffic light. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, so this is what basically uh, we've done. We went through the satellite imagery and started guessing like which could be and which are definitely not. And then once we had a few uh, like uh, a few options, we zoomed in. And if you now go to the next slide, yes, you can start. Oh, why is it doing so? Okay, it was not supposed to tell you, but yeah, you can see the uh, if you yeah if you uh, if you look at it, you'll start seeing uh, similarities. So first of all, you saw that uh, building that uh, Christian told about. Uh, you cannot see it here, but in the previous image, you could see it in the corner left. Uh, you can see the ad itself over there. You can see the, um, uh, the white lines. So the white line, one is solid and another one is dash. You can see the, uh, the traffic lights. So one is in the center. And the one, uh, uh, like the the further one, is uh, um, is uh, uh, what's it called? Semi, semi, it's like circular, semicircular, uh, and yeah, it also matches. So, what about the shadow? What do you think has happened there? Is it the trees? Yeah. So this is the case. So the tweet was posted early in the morning and uh, the satellite imagery is always taken like during the midday when the shadow is the shortest. So yeah, this is what uh, like we've done. And uh, yeah, what we do next is basically, yeah, we've, we've shown the steps that we've taken and we've just published about this. And at the next step, the like uh, German government officials, like uh, policemen, they 
I think they went to the place, look at some uh, camera, CCTV footage, and they were able actually to find the guy. And uh, uh, like keep in mind that this uh, like this campaign was uh, huge. There were like lots of people taking photos, and some of them were taking photos from their homes. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so here is another example. And uh, the Austin community basically on Twitter started geolocating those and finding where this is. And at the end, uh, like this campaign completely failed by ISIS and they were t like uh, tweeting on the, the platform saying like, please stop uh, posting this stuff. They're finding you, <laughs> the police is coming and stuff like that. So this is an example just how like geolocation in the first place, it can seem like very, very intimidating, but actually, uh, um, if you if you start, it's not uh, that uh, it's not necessarily that difficult, and if you s you just need to start slow, start from uh, uh, yeah, start easy, and then like open source investigations is a skill. So at Bellingcat, none of us had a specific education in OSINT. We come like from various like very different backgrounds. We have doctors. I'm an economist. We also have literature majors and etc. And we're just interested how the uh, yeah, basically, how what's the out there in the, on the internet and what we can do about it, and this is how we came here. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for taking us along detective work. Yeah, of course. I would love to take us into our final part of the conversation, actually, all together. Um, where we speak about, um, you know, how do we m really move forward towards solutions? I mean, a solution was already posed, we discussed it, but let's explore like, different avenues. Um, I want to maybe start with you building on what you just shared with us as well. I mean, you showed a part of the training that you do to teach people how to check sources and how to really like piece together truth. <laughs> um, do you believe that that is indeed the way that we can build trust in sources again, starting at just our abilities to do that as an individual? Mm -hmm. In uh, our, like in the current age, while we have these technologies, I think, yes, this is the best way actually to teach people how to use these tools and how to um, how to basically uh, uh, yeah, debunk fakes and etc. So for example, like reverse image searching is very popular nowadays and a few years ago only, only a few people uh, were able to do that. And at Bellingcat, yeah, we do think that just uh, sharing um, our methods, sharing uh, like basically our investigation steps is uh, the best way uh, to do that because at Valencat our objective is not doing like uh, investigations for the sake of investigations, but for uh, people actually learning it and applying the same methods to their research and to their investigations. Um, yeah, I also want to say something, but I forgot about it. Sorry, you forgot, uh, yeah, forgot, I forgot what you another idea. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm really curious about that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll come back to you. Yeah, cliffhanger indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. And, and briefly, Gwenda, just building on that, because you at Tilt also, well, partly have a focus on the individual, making people more resilient, more aware, more educated on uh, online manipulation. Um, but there's also s something where shouldn't we be focusing on the institutions and you know the systems, um, or redesigning the systems indeed to counter disinformation, or should we really look for it at the individual level. Yeah, we need to do it both. Mm. Um, what does it look like? Well, I, I, I think on the short term, we have to start with the individuals because before we can make a whole change. Um, and maybe it also goes hand in hand because if you improve the skills and um, uh, thinking um, of civilians or people or individuals, then they will help also build a better structure because I think they will have to be co-opted and, and, and be part of designing their own environment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for us, like, and maybe also because that is a really big thing, like having individuals become more resilient is kind of, it's a long way because there's a lot of individuals, but yeah. it is easy. Um, and we believe that if you kind of ruin the magician's trick then it doesn't work anymore. 
Um, right. And, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and if we can open the eyes of people more. Um, yeah, it is a giant task in itself. Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 Pedro, before you leave, because I know you have to go in a bit. Um, you know, like we're not talking about like this focus on uh, concepts of facts or disinformation, misinformation, understanding the difference between the two, really trying to like uh, become more skilled at, at um, seeing the truth. But I wonder what your thoughts are on that basic assumption that we're making, uh, you know, of that we need truth to build an architecture of trust or a common truth that we all believe in or that we all can see or all can. Yeah, I th yeah good question. So I think it may s look like a, a need, a, an urgent need now. I am not convinced that this approach might be the right one if we think in the, in the long run. Uh, I think that it's, I mean, it's it, a bit obvious that like the process of truth building and the process of establishing a common ground truth or, or whatever, it will be politically and or geographically, socially, cultural bias, right? Like how can we ensure that uh, yeah, the West Africans, they are having the same role in building a common ground truth than the Australians, uh, for, for example, right? If you are thinking about a global... Uh, structure second i think in big part the issue we are facing now it's because there is this culture of truth truth seeking right so any everyone wants to know the truth everyone and if you don't know the truth you are dumb and you're idiot and this creates for example conspiracies right because when there is a complex question without uh, a clear answer or even without answer for example people because they feel the need and they feel the obligation to access truth about this topic they will fall into a conspiracy theory that can explain this truth in an easier or mm, clearer yeah. way or even answer this question which is actually could be actually a question without the answer so i would see that in the long run uh, this process of um, building trust they should not it should not necessarily be based on truth uh it could be based on or in a single truth or in a single methodology or in a single ground of truth it can be based on truth but i think it's i see the future as a as as a place where mutual and uh, different and parallel truths and cosmovisions uh can um can co coexist because isn't that the truth maybe that there are multiple truths well, yeah, it's a paradox, right? Yes, you can say that that mm. the truth is that there are multiple truths, and uh, yeah, but it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's a paradox. But I, I would say we should, yeah, first of all, um, try to deconstruct this culture that of truth seeking, like extreme truth seeking. Uh, okay, some facts they are important to know, right? For example, if the vac if the COVID vaccine is actually, I don't know, has five G chips inside or not. But other types of truth, uh, maybe it's it's healthier if we don't have an authority uh, saying and uh, and propagating an, an answer or a proposition uh, for some types of problems. But instead, many of them and foster in people the criticism and not uh, truths, yeah. ready-made uh, truths. Maybe instead of truth, it should be just. Because a lot of people um, finding comfort in, in conspiracy beliefs or in science denial is because they feel there is unjust. Mm. And, and if we can have um, a more equal and just An way, idea of what justice means, you mean? Yeah, so, so a, a rightful and, and fair. Um, right. right. And then there could be different perspectives. I think people... Would, wouldn't mind so much of different perspective as long as the playing field is fair. Right, right. But if they feel it's there's injustice, and especially if you're on the side that, they are, that you are um, not having your rightful amount of influence or whatever, um, space for autonomy, or then that makes you to fight and become 
maybe um, yeah. yeah yeah exactly so really sense of justice Chris, I also felt that you, when we were talking about this multiple truth thing, thing that you got a bit uncomfortable. No, no, not. Uh, I, I mean, truth is. I think, I think Pedro is right that truth is not central. Uh, what what I said earlier, it's not about the truth because basically we don't know the the absolute objective truth. Mm. But we can uh, have a broad common consensus on the method of truth finding and i think the the culture pedro referred to as uh, you have this now this new culture i want to find the truth i think that is based in a lack of trust in institutions yeah uh, so it's not actually truth you need uh, it's trust you need yeah. Nobody yeah. can know everything. If you go to the doctor and you're questioning everything the man or woman says, you're not gonna get. Yeah, that it's not. Out. It's yeah. <laughs> it's probably also not good for your health, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's also not functional. Yeah, but this so is so interesting you need, to me. You need a trust. You need exactly. trust, and if you don't find it, uh, you go into truth finding mode. Uh, building uh, on your point, but, Chris. But can I just add one, one sure, more yeah. thing? That I think the the biggest reason there is a lack of trust now is that there is a disconnect between uh, the digital realm and the old modern institutions mm -hmm. that are closed up, uh, that are based on professionalism, like the democratic institution of parliamentary democracy. We choose a professional to do our bidding. There's so much trust involved in that situation, and the the digital domain demands so much transparency. Yeah, there's just so this sort of disconnect. Yeah, and I think the the, the, the emergence of of the digital society also uh, uh, forces us to rethink our executive and democratic institutions. Yeah, and now yeah. I just want to yeah. what I'm getting really excited about actually mm -hmm. <laughs> like going back to the earlier parts in our conversation where we also said maybe like we can learn a thing or two from conspiracy theorists about building trust amongst each other right because that's what we also said there's a lot of belonging a lot of trusts within groups that share a conspiracy can you maybe say something about that what can we yeah. learn there yeah, definitely that they're very eager to uh, have new people in. They actually target like the groups to join. So maybe we should do something similar. They target people. They uh, um, let them feel welcome. And uh, uh, the the groups mm. are like support for each other. If one creates this conspiracy, then the second would like reshare and give like a great feedback and stuff. So... Yeah, maybe we should communicate, collaborate more, definitely. Very enthusiastic about everyone's input. Yeah, they're yeah. definitely excited about each other's input. Excited about each other, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. interesting. Yeah, uh, and maybe if I can add, we wrote about it in, in the last uh, Gronauta that I think the basic, the underlying criticism a lot of right-wing conspiracy theories of right-wing politicians have is that they use this opposition, right? The, the free speech versus uh, the leftist control of media yeah. and institutions. And so it's basically they make the, 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 the they make a difference between the, do, the domain, the public domain, and the institutions. And I think in a way they're right. There is a disconnect between right. yeah, yeah, the yeah. demands of a digital domain and the institutions that were based on the logic of the printed word. Yeah, yeah. So that's another thing we can actually and, and we, see. Yeah. Yeah. So we should say, well, maybe you're right. Maybe you're, the, the answer you give, it, we, we, you, you can't agree with. But Recognize some of the concerns. And at the yeah. same time, freedom of speech also comes with a responsibility. Of course. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, that is often you can forgotten. Yeah. Violence. Totally. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. As a... Um, as a last question, because we're getting to the end here almost, I would love some questions from you still, but as a last question uh, to our three speakers for now, because you already are working 
on building a healthier public domain. You're already working on solutions from open source journalism to understanding journalism at all and how choices are being made to you know resilience against online manipulations. Um, if all goes as planned, you know, as what you're working on, is that enough? Or if not, what else do we really need in terms of solutions? Mm -hmm. So one of, yeah, I uh, re remember it, what I was going to say. So the other solution would be building communities, actually, because, for example... Building community, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, building more communities, definitely. And yeah, this also that what we can learn about QAnon. It was, yeah. It's a US-based thing, but it got spread so much. Because Bellingcat, for example, it's very popular in the West, but it's not popular at all in Central Asia. Like, even in Kyrgyzstan, even if I do research, it's still, uh, like, not many people know about Bellingcat. So actually... Uh, if there are already like existing uh, communities, then reaching out to them, collaborating, or if there are none, maybe just yeah, reaching out to people who would be interested, and uh, uh, yeah, trying to get a bigger impact because again, like people interested in open source investigation, open source research are usually like uh, like Western people, right? So yeah, so more, in yeah. more inclusive communities yeah, around it, yeah, yeah, definitely more diverse details. Yeah. Great, Pedro, briefly, is it enough? If no, you succeed, of or it what else do we need? Uh, <laughs> there's no one solution, but there are many, it's uh, no a mix of many solutions to make things better. But for example, things I could just mention, like uh, now building this trust on the networks is more profitable than trying to build trust, right? So yeah. we should uh, renew the economic model on of yeah. how the internet and how the major platforms, um, they function uh, nowadays, for example. We should invest exactly. a lot in pedagogy and training the public and building education, having agreements on methodology, changing our narrative to discuss and talk with those who are victims of conspiracies or disinformation. And we should build yeah these spaces to have an agreements on, th on truth building, for example. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Gwenda, lastly? Oh, there is so much more that needs to be done, uh, but I would hope that um, the average person would get more involved to um, overflow the information environment with nuanced conversations um, and not just leave the space to this 2% on the left and 2% on the right to dominate, to, each other. to dominate the environment and then have us feel like that's the only way to go. Yeah. So if all of us uh, go online and promote like conversations, even though it's boring, uh, but then at least within this whole bunch of information, there will be much more uh, solidarity and uh, empathy. And I think that will help us a lot. Yeah, thank you. All right, some final questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, I think the uh, challenge of um, an ir ir irrational uh, behavior that, that is sometimes very useful and when, uh, for example, and I think that on, t on two le different levels it is uh, important, thank I think, in this uh, discussion. Um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a person, we often have our, uh, well, we, 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 will, we will be overwhelmed and we will act irrational and mm -hmm. we, we have to uh, think about where, where, what, what, what happens then. Uh, but well, this is also, what will be the chain. Uh, but also as a human, humanity, uh, we have this... Um, yeah, these these challenges, uh, the climate, whatever, but that the, those challenges that uh, need we we need uh, the, the 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 paradigm shifts and the the, the, the not not only the the, the the rational facts, but mm -hmm. we also need the the the, the, the change of mind. Definitely, is that okay? Thank you for your contribution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Are there any any other questions to well j any just of to us? say like nobody is um um consciously irrational so yeah. as you say it always brings you something that's why we behave in a way it always has a gain yeah and uh, we have to understand what it brings people and maybe if we can find another way to provide yeah. this yeah i think mm -hmm. maybe what to add 
I mean, it was mentioned before that education is also an important part of it. Definitely. And I think one critical shift I think needs to happen in a lot of education, especially primary and and uh, said uh, like high school education. I mean, it's focused on r- reproducing knowledge. And I think yeah, there's a kind of uh, so let's say knowledge and the skills of thinking and producing the knowledge and acquiring the knowledge, they should be integrated. Mm-hmm. And I think now, the, let's say the focus is too much on, yeah, just, I mean, I'm getting the knowledge, I have to reproduce it, it's tested, and then I'm done. But somehow, how the knowledge is produced and the skills that are involved with the knowledge itself should be much more, let's say, uh, taught together also as an activated yeah, maybe information as taker an, as an add-on uh, also uh, what i hear from our guests is uh, that people should be taught to l- love themselves and to recognize their own thoughts and to uh, to have some sort of self-knowledge so that you can recognize your own feelings towards what you read or to recognize your own thoughts uh, if you read something so you can so it's the method it's the it's 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 the fact let's say it's the method of fact finding but also it's your personal attitude mm. towards all these things so also your confidence in a, yeah in our workshops yeah. we often tell people if you read something or there's content and it you feel like a emotional response right then yeah. that should be a trigger for you to think yeah mm. because that exactly. is unconscious yeah. reaction and that often makes you react in a way um, that from an emotional response and, and, and a lot of disinformation, manipulation, but also crime, it triggers your emotion. So once you feel this emotion, that is the point that you need you to like need zoom to out be on. And, yeah. and look what's going exactly. on. And if and you... That's, yeah, and it's actually something that uh, primary and, and secondary education r- for a hundred years are trying to teach, but they're so stuck in mm. these... But uh, it's it's a big theme in in education, yeah. Uh, Self knowledge, but they just it's it's hard to teach. It's a very big yeah. problem. Yeah. We have uh, come to the end of our conversation. Um, what I want to ask you, Chrononauts, both of you. Um, well, I'm just curious if if you could both like, take away one key insight from our conversation, what would it be? Oh, wow, there's so much. <laughs> Edwin is still <laughs> processing. Yeah, there's so much to unpa- unpack. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to unpack. But what, what do you think? Or like maybe a key insight that you think we all should be taking. Away. Well, I, I think the main thing is um, now we presented it uh, as a part of the solu- a technical solution. And obviously there needs to be a cultural shift Yeah. Uh, parallel to it or yeah exactly and which is also happening i mean pedro already mentioned the homo economicus but we're slowly shifting towards the homo romanticus more and more uh, making money is less important and finding meaning is more important Mm. so it's it's um this shift also takes has to take um must be taken into account and yeah Obviously, there's also a, a cultural aspect. Homo romanticus that loves itself. That wants to love itself. Wants to love that itself. That wants to, to, to merge with itself, with its true self, with its true community. The philosopher with the true is true nature. Immersed, <laughs> emerging here, yeah. Yeah, but you see this uh, yeah. uh, culturally broad. Yeah, it's it's a big shift. Yeah. For the last two hundred years. Uh, Edwin. Have you come? Have you come up with something? <laughs> yeah, well, it's just uh, a, a lot of things, but I think one of the main things, yeah, Chris said it also a bit. I mean, we're kind of uh, yeah presented the technical part of the solution, and I think what's kind of the challenge for us in in telling this story is how it connects to the, all those other things, to more mm. let's say the cultural uh, shifts that's dynamics. needed, but also how can you somehow argue or explain that this is connected to how a public sphere depolarizes or how how can yeah. these things work together and I yeah that's so that's kind of opened up for me yeah today, yeah it would be nice great. if you could explain like what do people do 
if this system is running. Exactly. So you yeah, well you want like a day in the life of a journalist working on the chain, right? Yeah. For instance. Yeah. <laughs> I thought Great. Yeah. Well, indeed a lot has uh, has been discussed here. We started out you know seeing that there is this disconnect between the current digital domain and those institutions or like the architecture of trust that was formed in institutions that are, you know, slowly becoming archaic. Um, we we had a better understanding of that architecture of trust as, on the one hand, the technologies, the processes that we use to have this common method of producing truth, actually. Uh, but we very much concluded, as Edwin was emphasizing as well, that on the one hand, you need that infrastructure, you need that architecture indeed, uh, made possible by decentralized tech, by legislation, but you also very much need the education, the maturity, the self-reflection, um, the understanding of how we perceive, how we take information in, how we come to truth. Um, then we, of course, talked about the scenario, the public data chains, uh, and we and we added some elements to it or things to think about uh, around accountability, around the security transparency, like how does it come back around the polarization? Uh, the, how does that interplay? Uh, and we came to certain principles that any solution should should have. So the do no harm, the stay open, the falsification, the fostering cr criticism to your own solution uh, always. Um, then, in the, the later parts of the conversation, we spoke about, you know, the civilians and these kind of ruining the magi magician's trick by educating ourselves and understanding how these things work. Um, we spoke about that this needs to be a wider conversation, that, you know, the average human needs to be brought in, that the community needs to be more inclusive. We can learn from the conspiracy theorists about how to make people feel welcome, how to create that belonging, how to, you know... Um, uh, um, connect uh and then of course we said it's on it's all not enough <laughs> until we have that cultural shift until we are able to really uh do this together and connect all these dots so a very rich conversation thank you very much for sharing your insights thank you to everyone here being here thank you for everyone watching um we will be back, uh, Designing Cities for All, will be back next Monday, the 14th at 8. Um, in the second episode, we'll focus on, you know, what follows from here, the interpersonal trust. How do we really relearn to really trust each other amongst humans in this uncertainty of the digital age and all the shifts that ha are happening around us? Uh, if you want to know more, there's also a great podcast that's been done with the Chrononauts. Podcast is Zwijger podcast that you can easily find on the Zwijger. Uh, while you're at it, um, you can also consider becoming a friend of Podcast is Zwijger because these programs are always free and accessible for all. But of course, it's great if there is a community of supporters around this great place. Uh, so you can scan the QR code that you will see uh, very soon if you're interested in that. Um, thank you all again for watching. There's more information about the whole program, Designing Cities for All. You can watch episodes back. You can watch this one again. Uh, you can watch The Great Scenario again. Um, the zwijger.nl slash DCFA. Have a great evening and see you at the bar.